So the, the, the last belief, Clay, you've, you've done amazingly well here. Um, <laughs> stayed in this interview till Believe 12. Um, zero COVID was achievable. I mean, that was the initial thinking, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. And, and the thing clearly, is, patently not. Just. Patently not. That's the thing. It was patently not. So, you know, the, the argument that you know, we have, in theory, rid the world of two diseases ever. Right. So there's smallpox. And, you know, I mean, even right, there's smallpox. And then there was rinderpest, which is a, a, a I can't remember what kind of animal gets it. What, what, what is that? Well, I don't know. That one. It's a viral disease in some kind of herding animal. <laughs> oh, OK. So it's some sort of animal virus. Right? I didn't know that one. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, the and, smallpox and one is genuine. I mean, it's 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 alive in Port and Down and a few other places like that. You know, but uh... so smallpox, I do find quite a, quite an interesting topic. And, and I don't have the answers on it all, and I haven't looked into it in that much depth. But the story we were told is that smallpox is a really stupid virus, right? So it's very, very slow. It has a 14-day incubation period before you become infectious. And then when you, during that incubation period, you're covered in pox. So, like, it's really, really obvious to the world around you that the diagnostics is easy. You don't need a test, right? There's someone with smallpox. And so people would go and do what they called ring vaccination, where they would find the person with pox and inject the vaccine, all the people within that group, so that they were then immune. And so they were, by the, you know, by the 70s, really, smallpox only existed in little pockets of rural Africa in the jungle, and these, these WHO groups were going around doing this ring vaccination. And then they declared that it had been eradicated. There was a sort of six-month period where they didn't have any. And they said, right, we've done that. That's eradicated. And around that time, monkeypox appeared in the rural areas of the jungles of Africa. And the monkeypox is clinically indistinguishable, except that there's apparently sometimes more lymphadenopathy. But, but you know, sometimes more lymphadenopathy, you can't distinguish it clinically. And it responds to the same vaccination, and it's a fairly similar virus. It, they use a smallpox vaccine against yeah. monkeypox, yes. Um, and, you know, the argument would be that on an electron microscope they look different, and that genetically they're different. But I, I'm not completely convinced by these arguments, because the, for, for a start, what you're comparing it to is laboratory-based smallpox, which has been in a lab in cells for long enough for it to be genetically different. And second of all, the other, the, the other source of smallpox genetics is from, uh, I think it was an Icelandic girl who was found in the ice from 17-something who had died of smallpox, and they've got this sample that was quite well preserved. They've got the genetics of smallpox from that. But that genetics doesn't look much like the one in the lab either. So, you know, I'm not really convinced that monkeypox is so very different from smallpox. Yeah, and, and the, vi the viruses change over time and diseases, yeah. diseases, co diseases come and go. I mean... Right, I might be wrong. But I do think that that story yeah. was overhyped. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a good story. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's... And I mean, ultimately, smallpox disappeared from the Western world with sanitation yeah. and nutrition. Sanitation and nutrition yeah. made enormous impacts on that disease, um, absolutely huge impacts. And the, in the UK, people were using variolation earlier on. Yep. So they would, you know, doctors would go to find somebody who had smallpox and take some of the pus onto a rag of cloth. Variolation, actually giving people the infected pus. Right, infected pus, but infected pus that was in a little glass vial mm. in their jacket pocket mm. for weeks. Mm. And then they'd find some child that wanted to be, you know, the parents wanted them variolated and they would make an incision in the skin and shove some of this rag in. Some of them did it with a thread. They would thread it through with a needle and leave the pussy thread in. Now, that's the bacterial um, culture you've got there. Yep. The idea that you have somehow preserved virus in that pus, I, you, you've just put all sorts of nonsense into that yep. child. And so people would have all these rituals around praying to, so, so their child didn't die from this because some of them did. So you know, people were killing their children with this very relation to protect them from smallpox, yeah. um, which meant that the smallpox vaccine was not just saving people from smallpox. It was saving them from this variolation ritual that they had that was horrific, really yeah. horrific. 
But the smallpox vaccine itself, originally in the 1700s, was um, they would collect what they called lymph from the cows, yeah. right? And they, had, they weren't keeping this in laboratory conditions. It wasn't refrigerated. It, and, and each one of these doctors would have their own special recipe and their own lymph. And, um, and, yeah, that's what they would then inject people with. And actually, if you read Edward Jenner's original thesis, it's quite short. It's a few case reports. Um, and he's, he describes how you see, his opening line is, everybody knows that old wise tale that cowpox can stop smallpox isn't true because we've all seen, you know, milkmaids who've had cowpox and they've got smallpox afterwards. But I think I've discovered what will stop smallpox. And it's a special type of cowpox. It's not your regular cowpox. It's a cowpox that's caused only in farms where the men clear out the dirty horses' hooves and then they come and milk the cow. So only where the men are sharing the milking and they leave behind a pox on the cow that the milkmaid catches and that protects them from smallpox. And I'm going to call it horse grease cowpox. It's so absolutely revolting and he wanted to cut out the middleman and inject the, the gunk from a horse's hoof directly into the children. That was his grand plan. And somebody saw that he had this idea that was going nowhere because people were revolted by it. And they thought, hey, this could be our route out of this horrible variolation nightmare. And they made him into this high priest and they absolutely you know, gave him tons of money, tons of money and prestige. And he went along with it. So the, the, the idea that he took the pus from, I mean, I even remember the name, Sarah Nelms, and gave it to James Phipps, so that the cowpox pus was on the milkmaid's arm. Is that, is that a... Oh, I think he did that. I think he, did he did do it. that. But the thing is, you see, with smallpox, um, as with all infectious diseases, not everybody was susceptible. So if you look at smallpox waves in epidemics across the world... Yeah. It, you'd have a, a, a wave and lots of people would die. It wasn't really it could be lethal if you're malnourished and oh, have yeah. sanitation. But it wasn't that going through the whole population. It was going through a fraction of the population. So if you've only got, you know, 10%, 15% who are susceptible to it, then when you're doing experiments to prevent it, you need big numbers. You can't prove you've prevented something with mm. a handful of cases. Yeah. So basically, um, will we will we eradicate COVID or? Well, yeah. Well, what's going to happen in the next ten, twenty years? Now a little bit, didn't we? Um, so you know, with no, the no, no, it's, virus, no, it's good stuff. Love it. With the respiratory virus in the air, you can't eradicate it yeah. because it's spreading through the air. And with the respiratory virus that has multiple animal hosts, you can't eradicate it because it will still be in the animal reservoirs. And with a respiratory virus that has, you know, quite a short incubation period, you can't. So there's just like tons and tons and tons of reasons why it, it falls under the category of something that you can't do anything about. And the people who there was something very odd about the thinking of these zero COVID people. And it, and it was, you know, it was around this idea that um, that it was such a dirty thing that they wanted society rid of that, you know, they were. There was something about it that was re disgusted them, I think. And, and so then they wanted to be obsessive compulsive about it. If only we could get everybody to all wear masks and to not talk to each other and to, you know, all of these things. And if only everybody would join in with what we're doing, then we could get rid of this thing for good. Do you think, well, no, that's complete nonsense. And of course, they would keep referencing New Zealand. That was always the reference point, wasn't it? New Zealand yeah. has shut their, their borders and they kept it up. But I think Jacinda Ardern actually said they could, uh, they could be the first country, to, I can't remember yeah, what she said she now, but first did, country but to eliminate the virus or something like that. Yeah, she did say that. And um, Just, to justify all sorts of horrific policies she was putting in place. Um, but if you look at the world as a whole, there was something going on in Southeast Asia and Oceania for the pre omicron variants. There was no exception, right? It didn't matter what the rules were in any particular country. You can't point to a region or a country that had a problem with the pre omicron variants. It just didn't take off there the way that it took off elsewhere in the world. And then Omicron comes along and they all try to keep it out. And you can't point to one particular country or region that kept it out. 
So this is not to do with human behaviour. This is a geographical phenomenon. Yeah. And I can't tell you exactly what it was. It's part environmental, like we were talking about those seasonal triggers before. It could also be immune related, you know, what other things have spread in that region, what other ecological aspects there are. So you know, the, the, the different animals that people are living alongside that are exposing them to different things that teach their immune systems. But it was a geographical phenomenon. It was nothing to do with human behaviour. Yeah, we've got these huge geographical phenomena, this huge seasonality. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're just passengers in that. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's kind of, the kind of, it, I keep thinking of all the experiments that weren't done that would have been so much more interesting. If people had managed to keep their heads and you could start to think, well, this is an opportunity now to learn all sorts of stuff that we didn't know before. So I think I talked to you before about the mucus lining and the respiratory yep. tract, right? And so what is it that makes that fail in some people? That's a really important question we don't know the answer yeah. to. Um, and then you could also answer the question, well, if you take somebody from New Zealand and you bring them over here during a wave, mm -hmm. are they going to be susceptible? Or is, you know, so is it being in New Zealand or is it them? What's the, what's the yeah. factor there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or some of my mates from Uganda or Kenya, um, yeah. who, who most of them never even notice having it or had a minor cold. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which, you know, it's a place that never really has a problem with flu either. So well, the nearer you are to the equator, the less of a problem flu is. And, and, the, and the, the more spread out the trajectory of flu, you don't get these sharp spikes. And the further away you are, the sharper the spikes. So if you go right up to Scandinavia, then it's all compressed into the tiniest of time frames compared with even here. Interesting. So, so much to learn about the, these patterns of disease that we still don't. And diseases can come and go. I mean, I think I've got the year 1827 for the first, for James Parkinson, first identifying Parkinson's disease. Okay. Before that, it didn't seem to be in the historical record. You know, a lot of diseases you can go back and say, oh, this was probably this, that or the other. But Parkinson's disease doesn't seem to have been there. It seems to be a new disease and other diseases. I mean, when I, when I was a junior psychiatric nurse, um, we used to have uh, patients with uh, catatonic schizophrenia. And now the disease just seems to have disappeared. I'd always assumed that was that was drug related. Like no, no, there was there was a group. We were, so in schizophrenia, they were called simple, hebephrenic, paranoid or, or catatonic. Mm -hmm. And we had these, they were, they were old at the time, but they were catatonic, they were called catatonic schizophrenics, and they would take it, they would adopt a, a bizarre posture. There was only mm -hmm. a few of them left when I was there, they were, they were pretty old, this is the mid-late 70s. But the, 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 the older staff used to tell you about them. They'd stay in a particular position, lying mm -hmm. cross-legged on the floors, and then all of a sudden they'd have like, have like jump up and have a manic episode. Right. Um, I, I, you don't I don't think it's being treated with no medication? no no because it, i mean chlorpromazine came in 1957 and it, it predates okay. that so okay. I, I i think it's an expression of institutionalization in some way okay. or, or there are chemical changes in the, the the way that we interact with diseases um but it, it is strange that it just seemed to have come and it's all very strange but of course psychiatry is a nightmare anyway it's, it's defined yeah, by what's in the diagnostic and statistical manual <laughs> oh, completely. The diagnostics is, is, a, is a, I mean, it's easy to say it's a mess, but I don't know how to do it better. You know, it's one, it was yeah. just a challenge. It's a challenge, yeah, yeah. I would say. Yeah, and, but with the Parkinson's disease, I'd have assumed that was because people were putting them into a broader bucket of something else. So you can always have a new disease if you're, if you're chopping up your buckets into smaller fractions. No, I, th I think Parkinson's disease probably is a specific toxic effect on the substantia nigra cells. Right. Um, there, there does seem because we can duplicate it. There's various yeah. toxin models that will will cause it from um, you know poorly produced design and opiates, for example, um, have caused outbreaks. A famous case called, called the frozen addicts. So it could be it could be some product of industrialization there that's actually yeah. acting as some form of toxin. And yeah. that's another concern. You know, the whole use of chemicals around the world is just terrifying and. But that's a topic for another day. Okay. Um, <laughs> Claire, we've covered your entire book now, and I'm really grateful for the, taking the patients to do that. And I, I really think it's important to, while it's still in our minds, you know, to document this. I mean, the, the book is the, the ultimate documentation, but to talk about it, I think, is also quite an important uh, historical thing to do, really. So if you haven't got the book, do get it. The links are on there, as always. It really does explain things, and I'm... Um, 
When, when's this next book coming out, Claire? And what's it about? Oh, John, that's such a tricky question. So I, I, I'm my own boss on this. And I'm, I've, I've sometimes really hard on myself about the fact it isn't already out. Um, and I'm kind of quite occupied at the moment with getting the inquiry submission in. Yeah. So I'm writing about um, vaccines and treatments for the inquiry. Is it and called a shot in the dark? No, spiked. I've called it a, a shot in the COVID dark. Yeah. Right. Spiked. And, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to do that inquiry submission and then use that to finalise the book. It's what yeah. my book is. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're going to put we're going to put the link to your Substack as well, Claire. So I know you put some ongoing things on there that. Are... Yeah, do do that. Thank you. I I I um <clears throat> I um will try and use my Substack more. Yeah, great, Doctor Claire Craig, pathologist, uh, researcher, uh, researcher into cancers and genetics, author, and lots of other things that don't spring to mind at the moment. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time, Claire. It's just been, it's, you know, it's just made sense of the last few years to me. And um, it's, it's been enlightening, if, if somewhat uh, depressing, but uh, quite a few of us now feel in a position where pre-warned is pre-armed. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll be a little less uh, trusting of various institutions and encourage a lot more free thinking. And if anything good has come from this, I think a lot of people are now genuinely wanting to look at the evidence for themselves yeah i Which agree is, is the nature of scientific empiricism it's all about the evidence yes so thank you claire really appreciate it thank and, you um, ever so much for having me on john for letting me talk to your audience as soon thank as this you. new book comes along needless to say you'll be biting your hand off to come on as soon as you, well anytime you'd like to just uh, it would be, would be great to have you thank you claire okay thanks john thanks